Okay. Let's uh, come back. I want us to start out with an exercise. So it's going to require you to be in your seat and to be comfortable. Uh, we are about to take another journey. Um, and we'll start in a moment in a vista so we can kind of overlook the historical landscape. I'm not going to give you a big history lesson. Don't worry. But it can help us a little bit know where we are. It's kind of like when you come to Lancaster and you come over the hill and you can see across the farms. You know where you are and you kind of get your orientation, right? So we're going to do that in a minute. But first, I want to have us quiet ourselves. Uh, and I'm going to start with having us do a little exercise. Remember, these experiments might not work for you. It's not doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It just means it wasn't your thing. Um, that's the beauty of experiments. You try something, it's interesting, or maybe it's not. In the scriptures, there's a lot of talk about trees. Uh, Psalm 1, being like a tree planted, right, by the source. That, that goes through drought, times of, but is still has its leaves of green. In Ezekiel, there is a picture of trees that have leaves of healing. It's looking forward to heaven. It's along the river, and these trees, their leaves are for healing. So I, keeping in mind that the image of a tree planted, rooted deeply, um, I want to play on that image uh, and do something with it. And so what I'm going to ask you to do um, is to quiet yourself. Just You can put down your notes and your papers or whatever you want to do. Sit in your seat in a comfortable way. Um, and what we're going to do is a little bit of a imaginal work. We're going to imagine something. Um, we're going to imagine yourself as a tree. Maybe that sounds really strange, but <laughs> in your mind, you can pick one of the ones you see out there or you can pick one that you have. For me, I grew up with a sugar maple in my backyard, and that's what I imagine when I imagine myself as a tree. But you might have a weeping willow, or an oak tree, or a palm tree. But pick a tree. You don't need to shut your eyes, but some people like doing that. If you don't want to shut your eyes, just kind of look down or look out someplace where you can limit the intake, what's coming in. And I'm going to carry, I'm going to walk us through a little Im imagery. So, take that moment. Imagine yourself as the tree. Where are you planted? Are you in a field? By yourself or in a woods? Are you near water? Try to get the imagery in your mind. And notice as you look around, notice the sun. It's out. It's warm. The breeze is gentle. Your leaves are moving with the breeze. Maybe you notice, are there birds or squirrels or insects, but whatever life is around, things are calm, things are warm. It's as it should be. You can feel the life maybe, the photosynthesis that's taking place, the sap that's moving. The sky is blue and there are clouds blowing by. Some of the clouds are big and puffy, some of them are thin. 
maybe as you notice more clouds coming in, you look and you see that you have fruit of some kind. Are there berries? Are there fruit? Nuts? Things growing. The wind is picking up just a little bit. Your branches are swaying. But your roots go down. You feel strong and secure. You're connected to a water source. The wind picks up a little more, and some of the clouds are a little bit darker. They carry rain. You even feel a few drops hitting the leaves. Maybe the birds become a little bit more still. But even with the swaying and the movement of your leaves and branches, the roots hold you fast. You're connected to the earth and to the water. And in a few moments, you also notice that there are patches of sun still. And the rain clouds move on by, and you feel the sun hitting your leaves, warming you. drying you, and maybe the birds start their singing again, the squirrels or the deer or the rabbits around you are moving. You feel strong and secure. and at peace. When you're ready, you can open your eyes if you close them or just look outside and see actual trees. Some people, when they do this, find that it's hard to hold on to an image. That's normal. We have lots of images in our minds other things competing for space. Some of you may find that actually you felt your blood pressure drop a little bit in a calmness. The things that we hold on to in our minds and the things that we put ourselves to have an impact on us, right? That might only have made a 2% difference in your life, not even 10. <laughs> Maybe only a 0.5%. But notice, and maybe that can give you some encouragement, there are things I can do that adjust how I'm feeling, what I'm feeling. I can, for a moment, put myself in a place where I'm experiencing just a little more peace. One time, many years ago, I decided that I was going to take up golf. Golf is an infuriating game. I don't play it anymore. I was young and a lot stronger then, and I could hit the ball far, but not straight. <laughs> Sometimes it was straight. Many times it hooked or sliced. Very frustrating game. But practice made it better. What we just did was a kind of practice. If you want something like that in your life, you have to practice it. We practice lots of things. Some things are good, some things are less good. So I might encourage you, when you leave here today, thinking about what do I practice when it comes to taking care of my mind, my emotions, my life, my inner life? You know, a lot of the things that I said already and the things I'm going to say are not rocket science. You know, taking care of ourselves is not rocket science. Getting good sleep, eating well, exercise. We all know how to do these things and we all struggle with them. The persistence is what matters. So 
If you're somebody who starts something and then feels upset with yourself because you don't continue on, it's okay. Get up again. Try again. It's not in whether you're successful in doing it every day, but do you start again? So think about some things as we're doing this. What's something I might like to start? Is it something where I need to talk to somebody? Is it something where I need to talk to God? Is it something where I need to be more mindful of what's going on in my emotions and place myself in attention, intentionally like we just did in spaces that help me be a bit more at peace. So let's go to that vista. Here's the vista. We're overlooking Lancaster County and seeing things. I need to take you on a little bit of a historical vista. The world of psychology and counseling and Christianity has been at odds, um, sometimes more, sometimes less. But um, actually, the world of psychology started out as people of faith. Many of them were theologians, philosophers, um, you know, uh, from the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, even into the 1900s. Some, the first uh, president of, I think it was the first president of the American Psychological Association was a pastor. Interestingly enough, in 2023, the current president of the Psychological Association is a pastor. And she sang a hymn as she gave her opening speech. Uh, amazing. So things can happen, but we lived for a long time in the 20th century where it seemed like psychology and our faith were at odds, where there was distrust, where there was dissatisfaction in this. And so it really did happen. Frankly, there were people, um, Albert Ellis being one of them, you don't need to know anything about him except that he thought your faith was part of a pathology and that you'd be doing a whole lot better if you would just chuck it. And for a while, there was a lot of distrust. If you're a person of faith, then we don't know if you're all that psychologically minded. Actually, not that long ago, when I was in my doctoral studies, I studied at Wheaton College for my doctoral degree in clinical psychology, I had to interview for internships. And I would sit down at a hospital or a place, and the first thing they'd ask, so you go to Wheaton College, are you one of those dot, 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 and are you going to come here to evangelize people? You know, there was this idea that I probably was going to be this person who they didn't really want. I always wondered in those cases, why did you even bring me in? <laughs> you already knew this. Was it just because I was an oddity and you wanted to see what I was like? Because many of those people didn't hire me. Um, but out of this environment where there was this trust grew the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation. You're probably familiar with them. A number of their books are in the back. I studied under them uh, before I went to Wheaton as well, so they're part of my story. Um, and there was a sense then with Jay Adams and, and those early days, no, our faith and our working through our emotions and our behaviors and our relationships are need to come together. A lot of people looked on that, even Christians, with some distrust. And frankly, sometimes what went under the guise of biblical counseling or pastoral counseling wasn't very good. It was sort of a just do right kind of thing. Um, but CCEF understood that there was a value in talking about our faith and that the scriptures gave us insight just like what we've been doing today. Um, they paved a way for many of us in the, in the counseling world to be able to talk about our faith and our mental health. Interestingly, the secular world has caught on. It first caught on in the medical world. Places like Harvard Medical School realized, you know what, we can't get good physical health if we aren't talking to people about their spiritual health. Now, they weren't interested in, in telling you what it should be, but they recognized if we don't make space for people to talk about their faith in our medical care, then we're actually not doing ethical care. We're not providing good clinical care. They started recognizing people who are in faith communities seem to get healthier faster than people who are isolated and alone. 
So they did research on prayer. Is it prayer? Is any kind of prayer matter? Well, that research has really uh, gone on, and actually there are people all around the world recognizing that when someone is in a faith community that is safe, accepting, gives space for them to express their pain, they get better faster when they're struggling with mental health issues. The data is undeniable. It's not just a weak thing. It's actually very clear. It shouldn't surprise you. You know this, right? You've lived this. But when we create faith communities where people can talk about their pain without being judged, sermonized, advised, told to knock it off, stop it, that they get better faster because they know they're seen, they're heard, they're loved by not only you, but by God himself. This is where laments come into play. So would you, if you have a Bible and you want to open it, or your phone, or if you just want to listen, I'm going to read to you from Psalm 13. <coughs> what science figured out late to the game is that we want to know where God is in our pain. We are designed to be in connection to him, and when we're in pain, we wonder if he has forgotten us. We wonder if he cares. We wonder if it will be this way forever. Listen to Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul, like by myself, right? And have sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider me. Answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my enemies rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Six verses in couplets, written as poetry, but designed to be sung in a community. So I want to read it again. And could I have a guest who will read, a male who will read the first verse, and a female who will read the second verse, and you'll flip-flop back and forth again. You don't even have to read the same translations. I don't care. But I'd like to just hear it again as if we are all bearing witness to this, because this is our heart cry. Can I have a male with a strong voice who wants to read the odd verses? Great. Would you stand up to do that so everybody can hear? Can I have a female who will read the even verses? Right here. Yes, stand up, and let's just listen with our eyes shut if you want, or follow along, however. So go ahead, begin. This is a lament psalm. In God's design, he has given us the psalms, not just a historical reminder of somebody who we have never met's pain, but he's given it to you as an invitation to bring your complaint to him. A lament psalm is a complaint. It's got a lot of things in it. We see. Uh, an address of God by calling him by his name. We see a request for, re for rescue and deliverance. We see a complaint. How long? Why? What is up, Lord? <laughs> it's, it's a complaint. It's a question that is not some neutral question. And yes, in some lament psalms, there are vows of praise. I will praise you. I have trusted you. But not all of them. When you want later, read Psalm 88. The most faithful part of Psalm 88 is the whole thing, but the most faithful word and the most worshipful thing, it says, O oh Lord, in the first phrase. After that, it goes downhill. <laughs> and it ends with things like, darkness is my closest friend. Do the dead praise you? What is up? It's as sarcastic as you can get. This is an act of worship to be done together. What the researchers now know, 
about the need to be in a faith community. God already designed for you to be able to express your pain in the presence of people who love you and to say it to God knowing that he listens. And even when it seems like he doesn't listen, we're invited to bring it anyway. Lamentations, a whole book on it. Guess what? Lamentations doesn't end in happily ever after. It ends with, if you haven't abandoned us forever, already. We love the pinnacle part, you know, that we have. I've stilled, and, you know, being stilled and quieted and, and at peace. But just before that, in, in chapter 3, he says, You've mauled me like a bear. You've made me eat gravel. You've shot me with arrows. Accusations. Part of our mental health recovery is to begin to express our pain in safe spaces. The question you have is, do I create that for others, and do I have that for myself? That is the foundation for where we as a community help each other. So I'd like you to take a few minutes. You have paper. Hopefully you have a pen or pencil or something. I'm only going to give you a couple minutes, but if I had a full amount of time to do this, I would send you off to write your own lament. And I encourage you to do this. The way you can do this is settle yourself when you have some alone time and just say, Lord, I want to be able to express the pain in my heart and give some space for what that pain is and begin to write it. You don't have to be a poet. It doesn't have to rhyme. It doesn't have to be in couplets. It can be tear stained. It can be drawings. It can be anything you want but I encourage you to express it first here and then to consider how we as a community, as a congregation, might invite more lament into our services for the pains that we are experiencing. So I'm going to give you a minute of silence just to think, what would be my starting line? Maybe you're still thinking or maybe you have the line and you know it because you've been writing it. Here's why it matters. Here's why your lament matters. It does two things. The, we'd say the healing properties of lament are it reconnects us to our community and to God. And disconnection and isolation is one of the major causes of the breakdown of our bodies and of our hearts and minds. We're not meant to be alone. Some of us are in family, some of us are single, and we live alone. But in the people of God, we are not meant to be alone. We are to be together, right? The second thing it does, besides reconnection, is it, it helps evaporate, destroy shame. Shame entered the world with Adam and Eve. The first thing they did when they realized what they had done is they hid. Notice God's first activity is to go and reconnect with them. He does not wait for them to clean themselves up or to come out of hiding. He pursues them. He finds them. He clothes them. He gives them new work to do. Yes, there are consequences. But shame is this thing that says, I'm not just done something wrong, but I am at the cellular level defective. I am bad. I can't wash it off of me. I can't change because I am bad. But God's word to you and his presence says, no, you're not. I embrace you. We have pictures of it all through the New Testament where Jesus is touching the untouchable. He is pursuing. He is stopping. You have the woman at the well where he's going to drink out of her cup, something no self-respecting Jew and rabbi would ever do, but he did. He asked her for something. She mattered. The woman who was bleeding was, un, was also an untouchable for 12 years because she would have made everybody defiled. He was on his way to a, a rich person, a, a person that mattered's house. He gets touched. He could have just stopped, but he didn't. He stopped. He wanted to know to see her, to call her daughter. Sit with that for a moment. He wanted to see her. And what does she do? She tells her whole story, says in Mark. There they are, stopped in the middle of the road, and everybody's thinking, we're going to a VIP's house. And he's sitting there having a conversation with a no-namer woman, calls her daughter, 
and waits to hear her whole story. You know if it's been 12 years that she was suffering, that story didn't happen in five minutes. Shame is a toxicity in our life, and God is giving us lament, and these are opportunities for us to realize that we are loved and cherished, and that the pain is real and we'll need to address it, but it's not something to be hidden. So what can we do when we're suffering with really painful things? I gave you some very overview, but let's talk about the kind of help we can get. First off, I understand that in the church you have people who are set aside who can do some kinds of pastoral care and counseling, whether that's a paid staff or deacons or elders or others who are involved who are able to sit and listen to you, pray with you. This is an important part. I don't, even though I'm a psychologist, I don't believe that the first stop should be me. Uh, it's too expensive and you can't, can't come see me very much, but you can be with family, right? And family can be part of it, and this is a family. So find your family. Maybe it'll start with just one person who is able to listen. Find that person who will support you, pray with you, remind you of God's presence, remind you of God's goodness, without jumping too quickly to advice, right? Of course, there is some professional care, and you have them in your midst here, and uh, there are resources on the paper if you're trying to figure out where would I start. There's even um, a little paragraph in there to think about how do I find a counselor? How do I start? Where do I start? Who do I ask? Well, start by asking your leaders. Start by asking your friends. Find out who has been beneficial. What their skills are, what they might be able to bring. It costs money, but doing nothing also costs money. Um, and I know that churches also sometimes have diaconal funds that can help um, with that when there's a need. But there is help. Medical intervention. We'll have a moment to talk about medications. What about medications? I find in the Christian world that there is a fear of taking psychiatric medications for depression and anxiety. And there's a sense that maybe if I take this medication, I'm either not trusting God or somehow it's going to interfere with God's plan for me, what he wants me to learn through this dark night of the soul. <clears throat> I want you to think about this for a second when we think about medications. Um, if you have a migraine, are you going to do better in worship if you've taken some medication? Or should you just muscle through it? You wouldn't. What if your migraine is stress-related? Well, I should deal with my stress, um, and then, then I'll be fine. Well, what if I could cut my stress down with Tylenol um, and take the medication and start to feel better? Wouldn't I have more internal resources to be able to use to manage my problem, right? So why wouldn't we think that about psychiatric medications. Now, psychiatric medications, like any medication, comes with benefits and side effects. And part of your work with a doctor or a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner or somebody like that would be to begin to examine, <clears throat> is there enough good from this that will help me? And can I manage whatever side effects might you know, also be there? But that's a conversation. But I'd be glad in the Q&A time to talk more about that if you have questions about that and you want to quick jot one down. But medications aren't our enemy and they don't block our relationship with God. There's not a substance out there in the world that can interfere what the Spirit wants to do in your life. <clears throat> we don't have anything that powerful. <laughs> so, where's the help that you need? Uh, by the way, if you're needing help, not everybody needs all the details. You need to be wise about which people are the people that you want to share it with. And trust takes time, right? You don't just trust people because they're sitting here and they, have, they say they're a Christian. Trust is earned. Trust is given as a gift, but it's also earned. And <clears throat> we could have another whole talk here about what does it mean to be trustworthy. Um, we could also have another whole talk to talk about betrayal. Um, betrayal is something that many of us experienced, but when it happens in the body of Christ, it is especially painful because the place 
where I'm supposed to be loved and protected and cared for, if it becomes a place where I was used, abused, mistreated, then it's really going to be hard to trust other people who say that as a Christian they want to care for me. So let's respect and have that conversation another time about how that might be or in the Q&A, but let's recognize that it can be highly uh, difficult for a person to trust. It can take a lot of courage for them to open up and tell you things. So what can we talk about some of these specific problems in our last little bit before we get to the Q&A part? I want to just highlight a few of the common problems that we might be facing. Let's talk about anxiety. Anxiety is like a blanket. There's lots of different, con a blanket term, there's lots of different things. Some people struggle with phobias, where they, a specific thing, like dogs or spiders or other things, trigger a, a response. Some struggle with panic attacks, where they're having a physiological reaction, where they're struggling to maintain their breath, and they feel like they might pass out or freak out, and they are struggling with that. It's much more of a crisis in that moment. Others have things called obsessive compulsive disorder where they have repeated intrusive thoughts that just pummel them and the only thing that seems like they can do is come up with a, something to do to try to solve it but that becomes a compulsion and it feels like a hamster wheel that they cannot get off. Fear and anxiety is a common human emotion. We all know it in some shape or form. The scriptures speak of it. And often we think that the scriptures speak of it in ways of a just stop it. Don't do it. Because it says, don't be afraid. Have courage, right? And so we see this almost as if it's an angry, irritated God who is telling us to knock it off. But the reason why the scriptures speak so frequently of anxiety is because it's what it means to be a vulnerable human. We don't know the future, and the world is dangerous. And I want to just bring to mind one scripture passage for you to think about it. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus is talking to his followers, his disciples, and he's saying to them, hey, don't worry when you have to go before the magistrate and you're probably going to be convicted of something you didn't do. <laughs> I'll give you the words. But about halfway through that passage, he says, Little sheep, do you not see? Look at the birds. Look at the flowers. If I care for these, will I not care for you? You can't say little lambs or little sheep in an irritated way, can you? <laughs> Imagine the picture. Maybe you didn't have this experience, but you're a small child and you're afraid of the dark and you're crying out for your parent. Your parent comes in, turns on the light, and says, little child, it's okay. That, that thing is not a ghost, a monster. That's just your clothes on the chair. Now let me turn the light off and hug you, and yes, it's okay. Little lambs, the Lord knows you're afraid. So what can we do, and what kinds of treatments are out there if it's a chronic problem that is overwhelming you, and you can't seem to solve it by yourself? Well... The most common, um, this is, by the way, the most common mental distress that anybody of us can experience. It is that repeated what if question, thinking about the worst possible thing. What if this is bad? What if, what if, what if? And we're fearing the worst. By the way, the flip side of anxiety is depression. It also is a what if, but I already have hopeless. It is going to be bad, and there's nothing I can do about it. Anxiety says, maybe there's something I can do about it. Maybe if I think about it more. Maybe if I do this thing. Maybe, 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 right? They're kind of like two sides of the same coin, and it's interesting the same medications can help both things, anxiety and depression. When you come to counseling, generally what we do is we begin to take an inventory of the things that have been making you anxious. Not to make you anxious, but to understand what are the things that are a little bit anxious, and what are the things that make you very, very anxious. And we begin finding ways that we can, like the tree exercise that we did, lower that anxiety because we want you to start to learn how to bring yourself that you can actually do something to decrease the sensations of anxiety in your life. 
Doesn't mean you'll erase them, it doesn't mean they'll go all away, but you are not helpless. There are some things you can learn to do, and we begin to practice. You begin to be exposed to some of those anxieties little bit by little bit by little bit. And learn how am I going to cope with them? How am I going to relax my body? You know, some of us sometimes f realize we're anxious by noticing I feel pressure here, or I feel tension in my shoulders, or in my scalp, or in my thighs, and we begin to notice how to do relaxation of those parts, because we're talking back to the body. It's okay. You don't have to be on alert right now. You can breathe. The simplest things, like breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth, can be something that changes slightly that sensation of anxiety. So that's the kind of thing that might happen in treatment. And there may be some discussion about medications that may be help. Antidepressants, again, um, we're saying the two sides of the same coin, tend to help people long term with chronic anxiety that they haven't been able to control by reducing some of those sensations. It's not an overnight drug, it doesn't happen right away, but it can be helpful, uh, can be part of the solution. Our anxiety, our depression are multifactorial, meaning there's lots of factors that go into it. Some of it's our DNA, some of it's our experience, some of it's our habits, right? Some of it's um, just what's going on in the world around us. The way we treat it needs to also be multifaceted. Counseling, listening, potentially medication, exercise, which is a huge component to our mental health. Um, we know that actually exercise and good eating is probably as beneficial as a medication is for minor symptoms of anxiety and depression. When it becomes more moderate and severe, then it's certainly not going to be enough. So that's anxiety. We practice, practice, practice relaxation and things like that. You may need distractions as well. How about um, depression? <coughs> Depression, we use this word rather loosely. I felt depressed today. Depression is usually something that is most days, for at least more than two weeks at a time, and where you notice that you have a hard time having pleasure, taking pleasure in the things that you used to have pleasure in, where it feels hopeless, where you feel stuck. Depression can look very different. Some people have more angry depression. Other people have numb. And you might think numb is better than uh, tears, but it's not always better than sort of the blues because sometimes numbs, it feels like nothing and nothing feels horrible, right? So when somebody says they're depressed, I want you to ask them, tell me about that depression. What does it look like? What does it feel like? Does it have color? Does it have sensations with it? Does it ever, you know, get better? Does it ever get worse? What have you tried to do? Because guess what? Most people, when they talk to you, they've tried a lot of things. Don't assume you're the first stop on their journey. <laughs> so ask them these kinds of questions. Depression is a place where we feel like we're hopeless and there's no chance of anything getting better. Along with depression, and depression and suicide are not always connected, so don't assume if somebody's depressed then they're also suicide, suicidal, but you can ask those questions. Most of us have thought at one time or another that we wished we weren't here anymore. Maybe we didn't actually have a plan or an idea of how we would do it, but it's hard to be human in this world and not think, I want out. The psalmist thought that. Where can I go? I'd go to the heavens and get away. I'd go to the, but I can't get away, right? So we can ask those questions. Have you ever been in a place where you thought, you just couldn't take it anymore. We can feel scared if somebody says, yes, I thought about it frequently. You might even ask the question, how would you do it? By the way, you're not introducing an idea like, oh my gosh, I never thought about that. Now I've thought about it. Thank you for giving me an idea. <laughs> That's not what happens. They've already had it. They've already thought it. You're just giving them space and light and air to that. Oh. What could we do that could make it a little bit better? They might not have an answer. 
how can we help remove the way you've been thinking about doing it? And again, if you're hearing this, you don't want to be the only one holding that information. You're trying to think about how can we get other help? This is where you're going to want professional help, pastoral help as well with this. Depression works very similar to anxiety where you're beginning to examine the things that are so painful and look at them and hold them and see that it matters to someone else. You're going to also begin to do small things like maybe walking or exercise and find that something can give you encouragement. Something can give you slight hope. And you're on a journey for that. Medications, again, can be entirely effective here. They can be very helpful. There are some new treatments, and people may want to know about those in the future. You can certainly get a hold of me and ask me things that people are trying, other medications, magnetic stimulation of the brain that may be helpful. We're trying out new things in the world. Um, a lot of these things don't yet have the research behind them to show us if they're going to be effective for everyone. Um, so it may be a little bit like trial and error, but there are some things out there because this is a significant problem. I want to move to addictions, just to say something about addictions. Again, addictions is something that many of us understand. We understand the, the intense desire for something, the attempt to try to not think about it, not do it, and then the sense where we give in to this thing. Addictions can come in all shapes and sizes. It can be from s sex and porn to food to spending and shopping to work can be an addiction. Um, there's lots of things that we can become addicted to. How in the world do we get help? Well, the first again is acknowledging that we have a problem is the first step and beginning to bring other people in. But there is a way that we can become better aware of what's happening. Most people who struggle with an addiction says, I decided I wasn't going to do it, and then I don't know how it happened, but then I just did it. I don't understand. Part of the work of counseling is to help somebody slow that process down to understand backwards, like, okay, just before I gave in, what was I thinking, feeling, and doing? And just before that, what was I thinking, feeling, and doing? An addiction usually starts, we may have biological predisposition to it, but addiction starts because I'm in usually in some sort of pain or something that's problematic. I try something out, it feels really good, it solves the problem temporarily, and then it becomes a habit, and the habit becomes something that drives me, even when I don't want to, right? So understanding a cycle of addiction is uh, something that you can do. There's a few free books, uh, booklets in the back of mine that you can look at this later if you want. But helping somebody or yourself understand the cycle of addiction. We start out in the morning, I'm not gonna do it. Maybe that lasts for an hour, maybe that lasts for days. But at some point, there's a little automatic thought like, I need a little bit of you know, rest, I deserve. If only, I'm in pain, I need. And that automatic thought doesn't go checked or answered or responded to. And it leads to seemingly unimportant decisions. You see, if I use alcohol as my addiction and I don't just show up at a bar, I don't just show up at the store to buy alcohol, there have been some seemingly unimportant decisions that I'm making, like I'm gonna go out for a drive. And lo and behold, I've ended up in a parking lot of a store where I can get it. Or somebody who's struggling with pornography, they probably don't often start looking on the internet for porn. They may start looking at the sports or the weather or the seemingly unimportant decisions that lo and behold, in my weak spot, I've given in. Even then, there is a, a part of the cycle, somebody, might have started to use their substance of choice, there is a way of escape. Why did I not put it down after one? Because I feel guilty, and guilt is the thing that causes me to keep going. So if I said I wasn't gonna eat Oreo cookies, and I ate one, well, I'm already ruined it, so I might as well eat the whole package. That's how it works. That's why somebody might look at one pornographic image and then stay for three hours. 
So the more we can start to understand this cycle, we can do something about it. And by the way, the cycle doesn't stop there and we just go right back to abstinence or not doing it. We often go into penance where ah, I feel so guilty. I've got to do something for God. I've got to make up for it. That's actually part of the cycle. The more we understand our cycle, then we can do something because we are looking. The scripture says there is a way of escape. So with a trusted friend or a counselor, what are the ways of escape when I have those automatic thoughts? When I start down the path towards seemingly unimportant decisions, who am I supposed to call? What am I supposed to do? A list of 10 things that might help me. Even when I begin to succumb, there's a way of escape that doesn't take me into penance, but into repentance. Understanding that, understanding that my motivation fluctuates, there are things we can do. Each of whatever you are struggling with or whatever your loved one is struggling with, there is help. If you're anxious or depressed or having intrusive thoughts that you don't know what to do with or struggling with insatiable desires or reliving a trauma that you can't forget despite working so hard to do. There is help, but remember, it begins first with accepting that it is true and that I am not a shameful person for having it, but it means I'm human. To be human is to be in need. Do you know Adam and Eve and before the fall were in need they needed God's advice and counsel. They didn't have everything they needed. He needed to tell them what to eat from and what not to eat from. Like them, it can be, feel very vulnerable to be in need of counsel. We want to do it ourselves. That's the main problem in the garden. They wanted to do it themselves. May we be people who are willing to accept and validate the feelings that we're having in others, the struggles we're having, the relationship problems. May we find someone who can be safe and listen and not quickly give us advice, but walk with us as we're discovering with others and trusted guys, what do we need? How can we work on this? Where we see that shame does not have to be the clothes that we wear but we've been given better clothes, right? The shame has already been born, it says in Hebrews. Jesus took on our shame. He despised that shame. He bore it for us so that because of the cross, we are not alone. He is with us and he cares.